Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Azari. I'm the president of this club, and uh, I have the honor to moderate this event. We have very important guest, uh, Mr. Dale Klein. He is the chairman of uh, Chair of TEPCO's Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee, and he will share his views on the development at the plant and uh, also on TEPCO's attempts to restart the uh, Kisha Wazaki uh, Kariwa nuclear plant. And we will have more talk about other issues related to Japan's uh, nuclear crisis and uh, the efforts. Uh, to get out of uh, this, uh, and uh, we will have about 20 minutes a speech by uh, Dr. Dale Klein, and then we will have, uh, after that, uh, questions and answers. Uh, this will be until 4 o'clock, or until 3 o'clock, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> And uh, after that, uh, our guest will uh, have to go uh, sharp at 3 o'clock. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest speaker today. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be back to the uh, FCC. I even recognize some faces of uh, reporters I've talked to in the past. So it's an honor to be back uh, to this uh, Foreign Correspondents Club. Uh, every time I come by and I see the pictures on the wall, I'm uh, humbled and honored to uh, be before the student group here. But no matter how many times I come back to Japan, it's uh, easy to remember what happened in March of 2011. Or sorry, March of, 20, uh, of 2011. The uh, earthquake and the following tsunami really caused a lot of damage and destruction. So even if there had been no nuclear accident, the amount of damage and destruction that occurred is overwhelming. And uh, every time I come back, I can't forget the image of seeing those uh, villages that were completely washed away. So the Japanese people uh, have uh, gone through a lot from that event. So today what I'd like to do is talk about three things. The first, I'd like to talk about the developments at Fukushima Daiichi, both the progress that has been made and the many challenges that remain. Second, I'd like to talk about the efforts associated with the eventual restart of Kashiwazaki Kariwa. And then third, I'd like to talk about TEPCO's overall progress toward the development of a stronger nuclear safety culture including something that is especially important to this audience, and that is the area of communications. So first, let me give a little background of why I'm involved in what I do. So my background is I'm a nuclear engineer. I've uh, been at the University of Texas at Austin for a number of years. I currently serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research for the University of Texas system. But my former job, I was chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So when TEPCO and Japan's government established TEPCO's nuclear safety reform plan, the plan provided for an independent international committee that would oversee and guide TEPCO in the implementation of this plan. So I was honored to accept the invitation to be the chairman of the Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee and I've served in that role since 2013. We meet quarterly, but much more often than that, we'll talk to the staff and to the leadership of TEPCO. We will offer them advice, we will encourage them when warranted, and we will prod them when necessary. The plan itself roughly falls into three categories that I outlined initially. One, it addresses the unique challenges of Fukushima Daiichi. Two, it addresses the needs of TEPCO's two other installations. One is Fukushima Daini, which is likely, not likely to be restarted. The other is KK, which TEPCO would very much like to restart. And three, it addresses broad management training and other elements that taken together constitute the company's nuclear safety culture. I'll start with the Fukushima Daiichi. As many of you know, in the first few years after the accident, there was a great deal of discussion of who would take responsibility and how it would be structured. 
Eventually, TEPCO formed a corporate subsidiary known as the Fukushima Decontamination and Decommissioning Company to focus on the cleanup. The idea was that the skills needed for the cleanup were much different than the skills needed for operating a nuclear facility. Masuda-san, the man who led the successful safe shutdown of Fukushima Daini, was brought on to become the chief decommissioning officer. Anyone who's been to Fukushima Daiichi in the last few years can see the dramatic progress that has been made. Ambient radiation levels are dramatically lower. People can work in most areas of the site without major protective clothing. A new administration building enhances working conditions with innovative architecture and bringing in daylight from above. A combination of measures designed to redirect, contain, treat, and store water have led to significantly more stable environment than the one we all remember a few years ago. The workers have significantly better working condition, including a new cafeteria, hot meals, and even even a loss in store. Lower ambient radiation levels mean that people can work more safely and comfortably, which also enhances productivity and allows the cleanup to progress at a faster rate. The J Village complex can now be restored to its original purpose, and that was training Japan soccer players. And most important of all, decontamination work and resettlement of the communities around Fukushima has progressed to the point that the New York Times recently published an extensive story about the return of children to Naraha. Still heartening is the progress and overall activity of moving to the most challenging aspect, and that is removing the fuel debris from the three reactors that experienced the meltdown of their cores. Ultimately, the full site will be decommissioned. Make no mistake, the completion of that work remains many years in the future with many challenges to overcome. A key component to developing an effective plan to remove the debris is developing a complete understanding of the present condition. That is something more challenging than might occur to a lot of individuals. Units one and three not only suffered a core melt, but they also had a hydrogen explosion that did enormous damage to the buildings housing those reactors. This definitely complicates the removal of the fuel assemblies from the spent fuel and looking at the areas underneath the cores. Unit 2 did not suffer an explosion, but like Units 1 and 3, it did melt fuel. Therefore, these three reactors require the use of remotely controlled robotics so that people are not put in danger due to high radiation levels. Earlier this year, preparation for a robotic exploration of Unit 2 included the use of a probe that was reported to have detected exceptionally high levels of radiation. These high levels were reported, especially in the West, in sensational terms that made it sound as if the ambient radiation levels at Fukushima were increasing. Some of the headlines included the words soaring, spiking, and so forth. Of course, the truth was quite different. The high radiation levels were detected inside the reactor, which was not surprising, and there was no indication that these levels were increasing. It was just the first time that TEPCO had been able to measure the levels at this specific location. Moreover, we know from experience that initial estimates of radiation levels are often incorrect. Spot measurements taken by a probe for a variety of technical reasons often end up being inaccurate initially. And my guess is that as further investigations occur, the calculated values will be more in line with measured values once they end up getting more reliable data. And these high levels will occur where you expect them, and this is inside the primary containment. The use of robotics has been essential to the effort to learn more about the condition of the fuel debris. The challenge of designing a robot that can withstand these high levels of radiation in tight and damaged spaces is very challenging. 
Toshiba and Hitachi and the engineers at IRID have done a good job in developing technologies. But the progress has often been frustratingly slow. In Unit 2, for example, the Scorpion robot proved to be unable to reach the pedestal area as a result of high levels of radiation. But it would be wrong to characterize these as total failures. Each effort has brought back important data, and I have no doubt that the engineers will eventually develop technologies and techniques that will give them the information that they need for the decontamination. No matter how much progress is made with the robots, it's quite clear that the fuel debris will remain in place throughout the Tokyo Olympics of 2020. While I appreciate there will always be concerns, we must remember that this site is no longer an emergency site. It is under management and control where only a small part of the site, site requires protective measures. The ambient radiation at 1F is much reduced and the surrounding areas have, many of those have been resettled. As the Olympics approach, it's important for Japan and for the citizens of the world to understand what the real conditions are in the surrounding communities and not end up in scare tactics that will damage the use of radiation in protective and, and beneficial areas. I'm confident that those of you in this room will be able to report information accurately but be cautious of activists that have hidden agendas and social media that can really distort what the real facts may be. Overall, the water management has stabilized greatly since I'm sure you will recall the days of a leak of the week that used to be reported. A lot of these activities occurred from hastily constructed tanks and other problems. Many long-term strategies have been put in place to route the water around the site, to, to capture the contaminated water, contaminated water, to treat it and store it when necessary. The overall quantity of the water that enters the reactor buildings has now been reduced in half, but no one should expect this value to go to zero. As long as additional water needs to be treated and stored, the question of storage capacity will remain pressing. The advanced water treatment systems at 1F, which are far more robust than initially, are essentially removing all of the nuclei except tritium. Tritium is an element of hydrogen that just has extra neutrons, and at the current time, it cannot practically be removed by current technology. While most scientists and health professionals understand it, that tritium should be diluted and safely discharged, I realize that this is a difficult position that will have concerns both for Japan and for the international community. It's not for me to say what Japan should do, but it's important to realize that the storage capacity at 1F is not infinite. A long-term long water storage strategy must be adopted soon to avoid delays in the decommissioning of the reactors. So I'd like to switch now and talk about Kashiwazaki Kariwa. Our committee recently went personally to inspect the many safety upgrades that have been made at KK. Many are hard improvements, like enlarged seawalls, additional electrical generators, and a gravity-fed reservoir that can be used for cooling even if everything else fails. Some are soft improvements, like worker and management training. We personally observed one of many drills that are conducted, and many of these include participation with the local community's first responders. I realize that within the last few months, questions have been raised about seismic safety tests conducted at one of the buildings at KK, and that TEPCO was not forthcoming about the results of those tests. Naturally, this is going to be a matter between TEPCO and the nuclear regulator, but I will say that effective communication is one of the aspects that the Nuclear Reform Committee has looked. And we have encouraged TEPCO to enhance their communication program. Their communication program is improved, but like a lot of things, it's still a work in progress. 
it's not our committee's role to determine whether KK should be restarted, but the dialogue is continuing in Nagita and across Japan. And I do believe it will be difficult for Japan to meet their 2030 carbon fuel reductions without KK and without other nuclear plants in the Japanese fleet. The last of the three topics I want to discuss today is the development of a stronger safety culture within TEPCO. Safety culture is more than just adding up new safety technologies or counting the number of drills. It's the attitudes, beliefs, perceptions, and values that employees share in relation to safety in the workplace. Safety culture is a part of an organizational structure and it has been described by the phrase of this is how we do things here. At the time the nuclear safety reform plan was adopted, it was understood that TEPCO's safety culture needed strengthening. There needed to be a greater respect for being prepared for the unexpected. In addition, workers needed to be empowered to voice safety considerations rather than just meeting schedules. Many of the individual components of the plan, particularly as they relate to training, communications, and management practice, are intended to create a strong safety culture. Safety culture can be difficult to measure, but the U.S. industry and many others have embraced this concept. And what they have found is that a good safety culture enhances operational performance. Our committee has pressed TEPCO to identify and use a number of key performance indicators that will help it measure the extent to which the safety culture has taken root. In addition, TEPCO's Nuclear Safety Oversight Office originally was a contract function, and this has now been moved into a direct management role. More recently, our committee is urging TEPCO conducted a sweeping self-assessment in all area areas of the nuclear safety plan. A report of the staff's finding was presented to the committee and is available for you to read on TEPCO's website. While I doubt that you'll find this to be a very exciting read, I think you will see that it was really a genuine effort for TEPCO to perform a critical self-assessment and to benchmark their preference against their performance against uh, really well-run companies. The most important aspect of that exercise is not any one specific finding, but rather the foundation of a habit of constantly seeking improvement. A culture of questioning, where can we do better and where can we improve? I'm glad to see that this culture is taking root and it does not depend on any particular manager or leader or even on our committee's oversight. It becomes a part of the company's DNA. In conclusion, while there's clearly more work to be done, I believe that TEPCO over the last six years since the accident has established a foundation that is sustainable across the changes in management and structure that are ine inevitable in any organization. I do believe a philosophy of safety and humility about what was our unforeseen has had a lasting impact on the company. At the same time, it is always important to guard against complacency and backsliding. And the Reform Committee believes that we have an important role to ensure that TEPCO continues to move forward and does not move back. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We'd like to open the floor to your questions. Uh, maybe you, you want to see. I'll just stand. It's fine. Yeah, okay. I've been sitting too long. All right. <laughs> Good. You want? Yeah, OK. I saw your hand raised. OK, thanks. I always like this is the, the working press table, so I guess everything else is unworking, right? <laughs> My name is Crowell. I'm a freelance writer. During your trip to Kashiwazaki, did you have a chance to talk to the governor? And as you know, 
the current governor and his predecessor have been adamant that they won't allow the reactors to restart until all, everything is learned about the accident in Fukushima Daiichi, which might take years. We did not meet with the governor. Uh, I would be happy to do so. Uh, but uh, we did not meet with the previous nor the current governor. It's clear the, uh, the processes are different in Japan than they are, for example, in the United States. As, uh, as I oftentimes tell people as a recovering regulator, uh, it was the nuclear regulatory's job to determine safety. We had a staff of about 4,000 people, and our job was to make sure that we protected the public people and the environment. And while we did a major outreach, uh, there was not the same structure in other countries as there is here in Japan. So I think once again, what this demonstrates is TEPCO has a responsibility to communicate effectively on why KK is different than 1F, what actions they have taken since the accident, and why it is very unlikely that an accident like that will ever happen again. So I think part of the burden does lie on TEPCO to communicate to the governor uh, about the changes they have made. Edwin Carmiel, Freelance. What is going to be done with the thousands of bags filled with radiator contaminated uh, soil? The, the question about the contaminated soil, um, again, uh, TEPCO will have to develop a plan, but their current thought is to have a lined facility where that contaminated soil would be stored safely for decades. If you look at what's in the soil and how it should be handled, most of that material is um, cesium and strontium that they will have to be uh, controlled for a number of years. The half-life of that material is about 30 years. And after you have a material that goes through five half-lives, it essentially has decayed away. Now, not many of us will live to be 150 years old, except my colleague here. And, uh, and so when you think about 150 years in a person's lifetime, that's long. But in terms of the earth, it's a fairly short time. So technically, that material can be stored safely in a lined, uh, low-level waste site for a number of years. Politically, that's difficult to pick the spot. Welcome back, Dr. Klein. Nice Thank to see you, you again. Uh, Aaron Shuddock from Reuters. Um, in recent weeks and months, there's been a lot of talk about the possibility of TEPCO joining forces with other nuclear operators uh, as one way of, uh, specifically with a focus on Kashiwazaki, Kariwa, as one way of getting uh, this, this nuclear plant, the world's biggest, started up again. Do you have any views on whether TEPCO should partner with other nuclear operators as a way out of this impasse? You know, I, I, uh, I don't, although I will say that one of the areas that helped in the United States in that regard was after the Three Mile Island accident in the U.S., the utilities got together and they formed what is called the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations because the industry realized that they were only as strong as the weakest link. So if you had one company that was not holding up its standards, then it, it impacted everyone. And so the phrase, a nuclear accident anywhere is an accident everywhere. So I think one could enhance the operational effectiveness in a variety of ways. One would be communicate, 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 and so that the, all the industries talk together and work together a little bit stronger. The other is you could form companies and you can say, okay, I've got a pressurized water reactor company and I've got a boiling water reactor company and, and they operate those. Either one could be done safely, but it's a responsibility of the industry, I think, to organize themselves so that they protect the public and the environment in the best way that it fits Japan. I open the floor to all attendants, not only regular members. Please, if you have any question, raise your hand. Yes, please. Uh, 
Pierre Boutier, I'm an independent photographer. I want to know your opinion about uh, the future of uh, nuclear industry. Uh, Toshiba collapse uh, and uh, Areva and uh, uh, EDF, French industry, is uh, on the way to bankruptcy. So, do you see any future for nuclear industry? That's my question. That's a challenging question, and it depends on where you live. Uh, the future of nuclear energy will vary from country to country. In the United States, uh, as I left the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we had 19 applications for 20 reactors. And we're currently only building four new ones. So the question is, what happened? And, and I would oftentimes ask my students, uh, you know, did, did they think that it was Fukushima that caused a turn? The answer is no. What caused the turn is cheap natural gas. Fracking in the United States was a game changer. And so the cost of natural gas is so low in the United States that it makes nuclear uneconomical. Now, that doesn't address the climate change issue, uh, and I'm not a climate change expert, but uh, if you are concerned about climate change and you look at base load energy, nuclear will have to play a part in that. So you look at the companies that have gotten into some financial challenges, Areva, Westinghouse, Toshiba, most of those have been due to the cost of construction and the complexity of the construction. In both cases, both for Areva and for Westinghouse, these were two plants that were started after decades of no construction and so they had lost the worker focus and the supplier uh, focus and so there were not the components that were readily available. So if you look at, at whether nuclear would survive and you live in China, you'll say absolutely because they at one time had 28 reactors under construction, they now have 20. And, and so when you look at China, they were starting a thousand megawatt coal-fired plant once a week. They, they need energy so, so much that they're building everything that they can. They're building hydro, they're building nuclear, and they're building coal. So I think where you uh, live depends on whether nuclear will play a part in that energy field. Um, I spent five years at the Department of Defense uh, on a leave of absence. And one thing I learned there is there's a concept called national security that has an impact. So if you look at Japan as a nation and, and they import 98% of their fossil fuels, then you look at how does national security fit into their overall policy. And, and so countries will have to make those judgments on their own. But I can say right now in the United States, nuclear does not look promising just because there's an abundant a uh, large supply of natural gas. But what, what that also tells you that these are major complex construction facilities. They're expensive, they're long, they take a while. And unless we change the way we do it, you will only be left with, com with countries that have government-owned uh, facilities. So, for example, Russia is a major player in the world in building nuclear plants around the, around the world. Those are not private companies, those are government owned. Korea is very active in this area, again, government owned. Areva was government owned but quasi private on their bookkeeping, so that's why they went into bankruptcy. So, I think what it's telling you is that when you have private industry with these massive long, complicated plants, it makes financial uh, aspects challenging. The technology is sound, but the uh, financial structure is a challenge at the moment. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Ayako Sasa, working for uh, NHK Japan Broadcasting Corporation. I have a question about the decommissioning of Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, the decommissioning is expected to take about 40 years, but do you think the plan, the roadmap, is uh, feasible, I mean, realistic? 
anytime you have a 40-year decommissioning plan, things will change. Uh, there will be events, there will be new knowledge, and so th things will occur. But I think the important thing to uh, consider for a nuclear plant, it is better to do it uh, safely than fast. It is better to understand your processes and procedures rather than doing it quickly. So my advice is to proceed cautiously, to understand exactly where the material is and how you can remove it without putting people at risk. And so I think it's reasonable. Uh, one of the uh, aspects that, that our committee looks at is in a safety culture is that TEPCO wanted to remove the spent fuel in Unit 3 in a fairly uh, aggressive time. But once they got in there and they were measuring the radiation levels on the top floor, they realized those values were higher than uh, they had expected. And therefore, they deferred the removal of that spent fuel because they didn't want to put workers at risk. That's an element of nuclear safety culture that I like to see, where they slow down a process for safety as opposed to keeping to a fixed schedule. So it's clearly, in my mind, it can be cleaned up in 40 years, but it should be done logically, methodically, and safely. Thank you. Yes. I'm Takeshi Hara, a member of this club. Thank you, Dr. Klein. <coughs> My question is, the most uh, pressing uh, issue on the part of TEPCO is the replacement of huge quantity of bags containing uh, contaminated water. What is the current latest plan for this uh, problem? Thank you. The issue of the uh, water disposal has been uh, one of the issues I've been focused on from day one. And when you look at uh, the water when uh, right after the accident, uh, a lot of that water was heavily contaminated. It had a lot of radioactive isotopes in it. Since then, they, they have a program called ALPS. It's a water treatment facility where they have filtered and removed essentially all of the radioactive elements except tritium. Uh, when you look at tritiated water, the question is how do you get water out of water? Since tritium is an element of hydrogen, so it's an integral part of the water. So it's hard to get water out of water. Uh, there are technologies to do that. It's very, very expensive, so it's not practical to remove the tritium. Tritium is a beta, beta emitter, which means it's a, it's a low energy particle that, that uh, is emitted. It has about a 12.3 year half-life. So if you wait 12 years, then half of it is gone by decay. By the time TEPCO gets around to making a decision of what to do with it, half of it's going to be gone just by the natural uh, decay. My uh, preference on the tritium disposal, rather than, than have all of these tanks, and again, you don't have an infinite uh, capacity to continuously store water, is to do what I call a controlled release. Tritium uh, is an isotope that we know a lot about. It does not accumulate in the body. It's not like strontium that's a bone seeker. So if you were to, to drink a glass of, of water that has tritium in it, then the biological half-life is much shorter than the physical half-life. So what that means is that if you drink the water, it will pass through in a, your body in a fairly short, so it doesn't accumulate like other isotopes. So I favor a controlled release where you, you blend it with uh, existing water so you keep the concentration low and you do a, a controlled release. Every country that has nuclear power plants has requirements for tritium release. Uh, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, has safety standards. So we know a lot about tritium. But what it will take in Japan is the a political discussion, a policy of, of what is best for the, the people of Japan and how best can they dispose of it. But from a, a pure technical standpoint, a controlled release is safe and it, it can be done safely. But it will be a challenge, a challenging issue. Thank you. 
Thanks. Yes, and you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Klein. Um, I'm Maria Maguchi with the AP. Um, I have a question about uh, fuel debris removal. Um, I think TEPCO uh, is going ahead with deciding with the uh, uh, removal method uh, probably this summer. And uh, uh, I'm wondering if um, uh, they have enough data or, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, knowledge about um, how to um, remove debris um, or decide methods of debris removal uh, within the next few months? Or do you think uh, they should make more uh, robotic research in, inside the reactors and take time to, uh, before deciding what to do with it? Thank you. Sure. Good to see you again. Uh, the fuel debris will be a challenge. And uh, what I would expect TEPCO to do is first get the spent fuel out of units one, two, and three. They've already done it for unit four, so the spent fuel is removed. That they can do is once they get the process to minimize radiation levels to the workers and get the debris out of the spent fuel pool so they can get the assemblies out. The, the fuel debris that's underneath the reactor vessel they will not decide on how to do that in six months. Uh, they don't know where it is, uh, and they will have to develop robotic capabilities. So I would not expect the fuel debris from the molten uh, fuel will be removed for a decade. They will have to uh, identify where it is. Then they will have to develop the robotic capability to remove it. No one in the world has ever had to remove material like this before. So this is something new, and uh, it will have to be done carefully and, and uh, accurately. So I, w I would not expect uh, that plan to start in six months. Uh, hopefully in the next six months to a year, they'll learn more about where the debris is, but the actual removal of it will take some technological development. Thank you, Dr. Klein. My name is Pieter van den Berg. I work with the Netherlands Embassy here in the, in Tokyo. Uh, you said that um, a, a large part of the fuel debris will remain in place throughout the 2020 Olympics. We noticed with the Olympics coming up an increased interest from, from, from audience and uh, athletes, sports associations about uh, the risks of the aftermath of the uh, Fukushima disaster. Um, uh, so an increased uh, uh, interest. So what, what would you say is a fair advantage advice to those people about the risks? You know, I think the most important thing is for people to understand what their risks are. And, um, and it's interesting in the field of radiation, radiation is something you can't see, you can't smell, you can't taste. So your emotions tend to uh, to play a, a dominant role sometime unless you happen to be like me and you spent your entire life uh, studying and dealing with radiation. So I think it is an area where the, the best thing is to educate and communicate. So I have encouraged TEPCO and, and frankly all of Japan to get more active in educating people on what the issues are. So if you're an athlete, um, it's probably no different than uh, the Zika virus that occurred at the previous Olympics. Now, I know from my perspective, I'll, I'll take my chance with radiation over Zika any day because I understand what radiation is. I don't understand the Zika virus. So, so again, that's, that's where you have to be educated on what the risks are. So I think um, the responsibility to educate uh, people coming to the Olympics or participating in the Olympics is a responsibility of, of everyone in Japan. It's a responsibility of the government. It's a responsibility of the utilities. It's a responsibility of the press. And it's a responsibility of the universities to all to get involved in educating people on what the real risks are and what their concerns should be. So I, I think it's education and communication. Thank you. 
I would like to allow myself to ask questions, and that will be on behalf of what you called as hidden agenda activists. They say that Japan is not in a position to bid in the world uh, to build nuclear uh, nuclear reactors in some other countries because it failed to solve uh, Fukushima or because Fukushima happened in Japan. So what do you tell, uh, what do you say to these people? And second point, you mentioned that the nuclear crisis is is under con managed control, but there are some uh, some places needs uh, managed request uh, protection. So could you please elaborate more on this issue? Thank you. What what I always uh, tell individuals, if you look at uh, nuclear accidents, what, what's interesting is is uh, I spent a lot of time uh, giving talks to Rotary clubs, and and occasionally I come back and talk to correspondents here. But the, uh, the important thing, I, th I think, in terms of accidents is you, you ask someone, when was the last coal mine that had an accident? No one will remember, unless it just happened. You ask how many people die in coal mining or coal transportation, no one will know those, those things. And you, but yet you ask someone about nuclear accidents, not only will they tell you that there's been three, they'll name them. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. So, so people react to nuclear different ways. To me, uh, the cause of uh, the Fukushima Daiichi accident was a bad location. Uh, you look at uh, underestimating the tsunami was what caused the uh, the accident. And. If you look at uh, TEPCO's own engineers in 1999, 1999 did a hypothetical calculation of what they thought the worst case tsunami might be, and they came up with 16 meters. At the time, TEPCO management said not credible. The regulator said it was not credible. The Japanese Civil Engineering Society said not credible. And what they should have said was, well, we don't think it's credible, but here's what we would do if it happened. And so they didn't take that extra step of those what ifs, you know, doing for the unexpected. My response to Japan is that when you think of quality manufacturing, what country do you think of? You think of Japan. There's no reason that you cannot think of the safest nuclear plant being in Japan. If they took the same culture that they have in manufacturing and they could translate that into safety and safe operations, there's no reason that Japan cannot be the safest operator of nuclear plants in the world. And so it's that safety culture, the motivation, the learning that, that gets them there. So, so I would have no problem uh, having Japan build a nuclear plant next to where I live. Uh, because the quality would be high, but I would want to know about the operators. You know, how are they trained? How does a regulator work? And what are those those next steps? The what ifs. So I, I think Japan can play a world role in nuclear energy. There's no reason they can't. They've demonstrated they can do it in manufacturing. There's no reason they can't do it in other fields. Back to, to the second part of your question about. Fukushima is definitely not a, a site that you want to just walk around just for fun. Uh, there are areas that you would not want to go into without the protective area. But that site is no longer what we call in an emergency situation like it was right after the accident. So you have to be cautious, you have to be trained, you have to be prepared. But it is now in a recovery mode as opposed to a crisis mode. And the longer that reactor core sits there, the more the radiation will naturally dec decrease. So right after an accident, you have high radiation, a lot of short-lived isotopes. Longer, it will decay away. So uh, if you look at the Russian-Ukraine response to Chernobyl, was just to encase it and, and let the radiation decay for centuries. That's not the approach in Japan. The Japan is to decontaminate and to clean up the site. So it's a much different philosophy. But they need to do it timely, but it's no longer a crisis site. Uh, back on KK, shall we call it, Kashiwazaki Kariwa. TEPCO, my understanding is, and uh, um, I think there's a bit of confusion about this, and I'm 
perhaps you can help clear it up, is that TEPCO has now said in, in their safety uh, measures for KK, they will uh, not build a seismic isolation control center. Um, and I believe the regulator, the NRA, has come back and said, well, yeah, this is going to push back the process. Um, what's your take on that? Is that a, if, if they actually have really stated that, is that not a setback in terms of them developing a safety culture? Um, and the last coal mine accident was in Iran last week, by the way. It did not involve the evacuation of 160,000 people. <laughs> but, but the question is, did you kill anyone? <laughs> 40, more than 40 people. Yeah. And, and, and so then uh, just a, a take off. That either. Yeah, yeah. But, but then a take off of that is the good news is uh, the radiation levels that came out of Fukushima, from what we know today, there have been no fatalities that are not likely. So you, one thing I always tell people, there's no perfect electrical generation source. If there was a perfect source, we wouldn't be having the debates that we have. So every uh, process for electrical generation will have its pluses and minuses, and we have to balance those. Uh, I can, uh, if the NRA says they have to have a seismic isolation, I think they will have to have a seismic isolation. Um, the regulator should be the regulator. And now the, where the give and take should occur is that if the regulator uh, has the right calculations for the seismic risk, and, and some of the analytics that we got into at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you would have a difference of opinion and honorable individuals can have difference of opinion and so what you have to have in a case like that is a referee process and you typically your scientific community will come to those so for example if the NRA says the seismic risk is X and, and uh, they believe TEPCO believes it's too high then TEPCO should come back and say here's what it should be and here's why so they, they'll have to balance so um, I saw in the case of the NRC sometimes uh, some of the staff would become over-regulatory. Uh, you know, for example, if 10 guards are good, 1,000 are even better, so why not do 1,000? So you have to do those those kind of trade-offs. But those should be handled in a public manner, and the, the both sides should say what the requirements are, and they should come through that. But, but I believe uh, if the regulator requires it, then TEPCO will have to meet those requirements. Thomas Sullivan, Dr. Klein. Uh, good to see you again. Um, I, I wonder, uh, could you just, uh, sorry to change the subject slightly, but could you give us your impressions of the energy policies of the new U.S. administration, and in particular maybe the Secretary of Energy, who's a fellow Texan, um, and also just their policies on, on nuclear and Yucca Mountain, and, and obviously you, you've got storage issues, nuclear waste storage issues in the United States that haven't been resolved for decades. Thank you. That's a great question. I, I used to give a, a bonus exam question uh, to my students, and I would ask them to tell me the three most important elements of our national energy plan. I would get great answers that were all wrong, because we have no national energy policy. Uh, we have never had one and probably never will. Uh, we'll have little snippets. Uh, but we have never been able in the United States to have a comprehensive integrated energy plan. So typically what we do is we'll go from one source to another source. And uh, so I, 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 think, I think the challenge that we have in the United States is people think the Department of Energy actually deals with energy. Uh, and it is not. You look at two-thirds of their budget is nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons cleanup. So the part of the Department of Energy's budget that really deals with energy is very, very small. So you've got uh, a lot of basic science from the national labs. You've got uh, the weapons and weapons cleanup, and then you just have a little bit that's, that's real energy. But I, I do think this administration, which is unique in a lot of ways, uh, will try to move forward on solving the nuclear waste issue. Uh, the whole world that has nuclear power believes that ultimately a geological disposal is the best way to go. So for example, if you look at geological formations, a lot of these have been stable for millions of years. If you recycle the spent fuel, 
then after about six to seven hundred years, it's less radioactive than what you mined. If you don't recycle it, it's about 10,000 years. So from a geological time frame, 10,000 is, is a pretty short time, but to a human time, that's pretty long. So I think the, all the world will look at geological disposal. You know, Finland, Sweden are gonna be first. And I do believe that this administration will push forward uh, for a decision on Yucca Mountain. Uh, as an aside, probably my most frustrating aspect that occurred to me while I was chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was the, administ the Obama administration pulling the rug out from under that application. I had 150 people who had spent over 20 years getting ready to do a safety evaluation of that license. That license was over 8,000 pages. It referenced over a million technical documents. And what was frustrating for me as a regulator, unless the law is changed on whether that site was safe or safe enough or not safe, was up to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It was not up to the president. It was not up to the Secretary of Energy, and it certainly was not up to Senator Reid in Nevada. And so, unless the law is changed, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's job is to evaluate a technical evaluation of that site to determine on whether it is safe. I would like to see that process continue in the NRC to make that evaluation. Uh, I didn't read the 8,000 pages. Uh, some of the administration and the senators were very fast readers if they read it. Uh, I had a staff of 150 that were not able to make that decision, so I'd like to see that process uh, be decided. Whether they implement it is a political decision, but whether that site is acceptable is a technical decision. Tom? Short questions to us. Would you say that Prime Minister Abe was on solid ground when a few years ago he told the Olympic Committee that everything was under control regarding the, the nuclear plants? Well, as a recovering regulator, nothing is ever under control totally. But I think he, my opinion is he made the decision at the 100,000 foot it's under control enough that people are not at risk to have the Olympics. Not at risk of what? It was not at risk of having the Olympics in Japan. So, it, it, so I, think from, I think his statement was accurate that it's under control from the standpoint that it should not rule out Japan hosting the Olympics. I think this will be the last question. Uh, it's about the uh, decreasement of uh, half-life of uh, radiation. Uh, when, you are when people are contaminated by uh, radionuclides, it's, uh, it's really impossible to evacuate uh, radiation from the uh, body. So my, my question is, uh, uh, is to relocate people uh, in a nuclear contaminated area like Naimie or Itate or something. Uh, do, you, do you think it's, uh, it's a moral, moral policy? Is there, is, there, is, there in, uh, is there any uh, any moral for, 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 for doing that? Yeah, from, from my opinion, one of the reasons that I uh, became a nuclear engineer is that I grew up on a family farm and I saw what electricity did to make our lives better. Uh, so we had augers instead of having to shovel by hand. We had electric milking machines rather than milking by hand. Uh, we didn't have air conditioning until much later. So when I look at, at uh, on how lives are improved worldwide. You look at bringing people out of poverty into a better lifestyle, longer living, and, and so forth. Having electricity is a big deal. That's what really lets people's quality of lives be enhanced. 
So then I looked at, okay, if we're going to have electricity, how is the best way to generate that electricity? For me, nuclear has to be a part of that solution. Not, not all nuclear, but a part of that solution. And the reason is when you split an atom of uranium-235, you get 100 million times the amount of energy than when you form CO2. So you look at the binding forces of that atom, and when you split it, it's a very efficient form of generation. So we know a lot about radiation, we know a lot about safety, and we have to make choices of how do we want to enhance people's lives and getting out of poverty. So I'm a real fan of electricity, and for me personally, I like nuclear energy. It's not without risk, but nothing we do is without risk. People have the same response to flying. You know, they will, they will be petrified to fly, but yet they'll hop in their car after a few drinks and drive because they believe they're in control rather than a pilot. So, you know, people react to different risks. To me, I think nuclear should be a part of our energy picture, but that's a policy call. But it's, for me, I, I try to base things on science and on facts, not emotions. And, and so I believe that, uh, you know, when I retire, I want to snuggle up to a nuclear plant because my property taxes are going to be low, the roads are going to be good, the hospitals are going to be good because of that big, massive, clean industry that's nearby. Other people may not have that same view. But for me, I think that nuclear should be a part of our energy picture, but it requires attention. You cannot become complacent, and you have to have a strong, independent regulator to make sure that it stays that way. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this event. I would like to give you one year honorary membership. Please come back and tell us more about this. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.